it's like telling the story of how Dawn started. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so when I got involved with Dawn, I was completely zapped. <laughs> Okay, Dawn didn't exist when I got involved because I was invited to the first meeting. I was clueless. <laughs> I don't even know what they're talking about. There's a full of the acronyms, a lot of very deep analysis. At that moment, what was discussed there, I felt that I knew nothing about, so I felt very like, oh, I don't know if I'm understanding. My first meeting, I could, half of it, I could not gather. You know, it was really beyond my capacity. Gita's work had always already inspired me, so I already knew of Don. La primera vez que escuché a las compañeras de Don dije, pa, estas minas la tienen reclara. O sea, saben exactamente, entienden exactamente el mundo, cómo funciona y tienen algunas coordenadas para saber cómo transformarlo. Yo creo que j'ai été là également très très séduite par la par les débats, la tournée que ça prenait, par le raisonnement, par l'efficacité. Uh, the, the, the logic. The beautiful way by which they would throw me in the deep end and ask me to speak in a session and uh, repose faith in my mental capabilities uh, was uh, amazing. Es mi familia. Don es mi familia. Y las familias eh, que uno puede elegir, ¿no? Porque yo elijo seguir en esta familia. It was 1984, and uh, Devaki Jain invited me to come to this meeting in Bangalore. And that's where I met everybody, um, uh, Gita, Claire Slater, and many others. I think we are the three that have continued uh, together up to now. So Dawn, of course, got, was um, sort of its first sparks came from this famous meeting in Bangalore that took place in 1984, um, where um, a number of the women who then came to be known as Dawn's founders were brought together for a collective brainstorming, um, which was triggered by the fact that the Nairobi Third World Conference was on women was coming up in about a year's time. It was very fluid. See, the project originally was, well, gathering to share our experience of development, mm -hmm. right? What has been women in these different regions of the South's development experience? And it was more than just economic development experience and, you know, how aid was affecting, wasn't, it was about more than that. It was about what was happening in the South. <laughs> I heard Claire talking about militarism, uh, the testing of nuclear weapons in the Pacific. And I never thought of militarism as having anything to do with women. Uh, coming from the Caribbean. Gita and Devaki were talking about the rise of religious fundamentalism. Again, this was not something that I had thought about in terms of women's lives, although it's central to understanding women's lives in that part of the world. Now, of course, it's everywhere, you know, we have We've seen that rise of religious fundamentalism in the Caribbean too, um, but it wasn't there in 1984. There were these different crises, and Dawn's first analysis actually linked them. Mm? 
and situated what was happening in the South in the context of colonialism, of the whole sort of development, I don't know whether you'd call it the agenda, but the processes of so-called development, North to South <laughs> approaches and impacts on women. We talked about colonialism and neocolonialism. Again, uh, I'd never thought of that before. And as we talked about these apparently different uh, experiences of women in different parts of the South, um, we realized that they, what linked them all, well, we realized first that there was a theme, crisis. The theme of crisis was, was emerging as a theme. And that what linked them all was a particular kind of economic model that privileged growth over social development. You know, a new round of, if you like, colonization of the world by the strongest states, which were acting in the interests of actually private, yeah, players, and private drivers of the economy, but also how states began to influence global policy making. And this is what we were doing in Dawn, actually really just analyzing what was happening. So we had our meeting. We. It was wonderful in Bangalore. Uh, Devaki made sure that we had a good sampling of Indian cuisine from all from each state, the different kinds of uh, food, and it was just lovely. It was in her family home, getting to know people from different parts of the world, and recognizing that we all had a common uh, experience in a, in a certain sense of colonialism, and. Uh, uh, subordination to this particular economic model that was not in the interests of poor, poor women? I think it was um, 84 or 85. I'm not quite sure that there was this book that came out by Dawn um, about the crisis, because there was a global crisis at that particular moment, and detailing um, how it was affecting women. Um, and the ways in which they were resisting this um, struggle. It wasn't a long time to write the, what then became the first Dawn book, Development Crises and Alternative Visions, Third World Women's Perspectives. And we had um, a little bit of money to call meetings, so the meetings of the group, we had a, a meeting in Bergen in Norway because the Norwegians gave us some money along with the Ford Foundation to pull this meeting together to look at a draft. And that draft literally got written in the end in three weeks. This is from 1986. It's the very first Dawn t-shirt that was ever made. So, um, you have to see this photograph. <laughs> it is a completely amazing photograph. And let me see. It's, a, it's, it's from Bergen, the Dawn meet. We weren't even call ourselves Dawn at that time. It was the Bergen meeting at which the first Dawn book was in draft form to be finalized. So all of this group had to agree that we could go ahead and put that book out under our collective um, imprint, so to speak. So there is a whole bunch of people you may or may not recognize in their youth, many of whom are in this room right now, all looking very demure and young and sweet. I, the, talking about demureness, there's one here who's got... <laughs> Claire, there's another one here who's giving that look, one of those comedy looks, <laughs> who is Zen. My primary purpose for bringing this is to show the young, you youngsters that we used to be young at once. I'm going to cheat like everybody else because I brought more stuff than just one picture. 
I also brought this book, as I'm sure you all know it, the first Dawn book. And uh, you can also see what a sophisticated cover it had. Uh, but it was a game changer in feminist literature at that particular moment. I mean, it was a seminal work by any account. And it was the first time a group of Southern feminists had actually, you know, brought together an analysis of the experience of feminists in the South, of women in the South, from a feminist perspective. When I first engaged with Dawn, I think I engaged with the Dawn book, uh, Development, Crisis and Alternatives, I think it was called. One of the founder members of Dawn, Dr. Kumari Jawadana, is, uh, is um, uh, a scholar from Sri Lanka. And she was discussing alternatives to development using the book uh, in Sri Lanka. And then other people like Sunilabi Sekhar, various people, um, had, had heard of Dawn. They had, I think, been in Nairobi in 1985. Um, and so towards the end of the 80s, uh, there was a possibility of, of you know, using the book in, in discussions. And that's how um, I was maybe introduced to Dawn and its politics. And I hadn't met any Dawn people except in maybe Kumari. Gita was the lead author and it was kind of a collectively informed and, yeah, because it was sent out as a draft and people made changes to it. And it was then, you know, finessed. And, but when we took that to... Um, Kenya to the Third World Conference on Women, um, it made a huge impact. It is significant that the end of the decade conference should take place in this beautiful country of Africa where many of the challenges and hopes for the future of developing countries are crystallized. Um, it made a huge impact, but it also, and this is actually really quite critical, it put macroeconomic issues on the table for feminists. That was introducing the feminist movement. Because up until now, that it was actually a equality between men and women, but also from the South, you know, the colonialism, the North-South divide, but it didn't really get into looking critically at macroeconomic issues. Then when we went to Nairobi with this platform document, it was amazing because it was almost as if this is what the, uh, the the, the international women's movement at the time, the women who came to Bangalore from all over the world for this non-governmental forum and conference had been, had been looking for um, the kind of analysis that made those links so that you're not just talking about violence against women as a social issue without recognizing the economic aspects of it, the political, the cultural, you know, that kind of thing. We, were, we didn't call us, we had no name at that point. Um, group of the people who had been at Bangalore and who were part of this effort came, went to Nairobi with a whole series of panels and sessions in Nairobi. And it was funny because at the meeting we recently had, it was you who said, um, it was Sonia Correa who said that um, she tried to get into the room, and which was overflowing, and there was no way to get into the room. I've learned of Dawn for the first time in the Nairobi Conference of 1985. I was one of the few privileged Brazilians to be there. We were, I guess, no more than 10. And it was in that churn <laughs> of learning, meeting women from all over the place, that I, for, for the first time I've heard of Dawn. I tried to, to get to one of the dawn panels and I could not because the room was so packed that I was just in the door of the room like trying, very tall woman in front of me trying to, so I didn't stay long because it was very hard to hear. But I've heard that Dawn was presenting an incredible frame. Uh, and I remember seeing, uh, I guess I have seen Gita there. Huh? If there was, uh 
sentence we use to describe our approach, it, um, to ask the critical questions about development in the context of gender equality, it would probably be the question, who needs a larger share of a poisoned pie? Mm -hmm. Meaning if the development pie is poisoned, how does it help women to get an equal share of that? That message, when it coming at a time when structural adjustment pushed by the World Bank and the IMF was in fact devastating um, countries in Latin America and Africa particularly, to some extent in Asia, um, um, basically reducing expenditures, um, fiscal deficits, in the name of efficiency, in the name of removing corruption, and who knows what. Those critiques had huge resonance in Nairobi, and Dawn was pretty much born out of, um, out of that. Um, and has continued to grow, to change, to move, to make, to remain um, relevant, um, to respond to challenges as they emerge. Um, and we're still here. It was a preparatory meeting for Beijing that was done in Cuba. And you, that was the general coordinator of Dawn, support. You remember this? No. <laughs> <laughs> because we are in Mexico, I never used Sororidad. But I, I, I find in the Google that in English is sorority. <laughs> for me that is very important is try to be a cultural translator. Because <laughs> during our life in Dawn, we have misunderstanding, oh. conflict, da, 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 this and that, <laughs> between the rich and the Latinas. <laughs> and I found that this is our difficult to understand some other cultures, but at the end we are friends and we we have a lot of things in common, and we can, we can uh, pass on, uh, these, these things and learn. Well, the other thing about Dawn is that we named ourselves feminists. Now, that was very interesting because usually, at least to women like myself, the word feminist was associated with, with white North American women or European women. We didn't think of ourselves as feminists. So for a, a, net, a group of women from Africa and Asia and Latin America to, to say we are feminists, that's a big thing. That was a big thing. C'était une époque, il y avait une bataille féroce entre le féminisme occidental, globalement, qui n'est pas un bon mot hein, d'ailleurs pour le qualifier. Parce que quand on prend le féminisme français, nord-américain et anglais, bon, euh, il y a quand même des différences euh, assez, assez significatives. Mais pour les Africains que nous étions et les gens du tiers monde que nous étions, il y avait cette, euh, ce que nous appelions nous l'arrogance des féministes du Nord qui imposaient leur point de vue à tout le monde. Et souvent, elles avaient des, des débats euh, qui n'étaient pas forcément les nôtres parce que nous n'étions pas dans les mêmes situations de développement économique, nous n'étions pas dans les mêmes rapports de force entre le Nord et le Sud. Et on avait quand même beaucoup de, de confrontations. Dawn's role in shaping the sexual and reproductive health and rights um, paradigm shift of the ICPD Cairo conference um, was especially important because we acted as the honest broker between women's group, women's rights groups from the north and women's rights groups from the south. And our role was crucial in that it was that ability to bridge 
what seemed at one point to be very hard differences between these groups uh, that made it that made the Cairo conference happen. I don't think the paradigm change of Cairo would have happened towards sexual and reproductive health and rights in terms of population related policies uh, without that role. Uh, and I'm of course speaking as Dawn, but I think there would be many who would acknowledge um, that that uh, that that's um, the case. came very late to understanding the importance of being in those conferences because I was kind of like, let's, I kind of thought, oh, autonomy in the, in the, the women's movement and let's have our own strategies. It was not, it was almost sort of seeing that we needed to do what we did as activists and without seeing that actually getting the governments to agree on things and then having that as a, you know, a, a le- being able to use that as leverage in getting them to, com- to, you know, implement what they'd agreed to was so important, you know. But I'd, I think I just came out of a not really wanting to work with governments, just wanting to work autonomously and without seeing. So for a long time, I think, you know, up until probably the 90s, uh, um, mid-90s, yeah, probably until Beijing, and then realising that actually, hey, this was more important than having your separate thing you know, that was important, but you needed to infuse whatever was coming out of this into what the governments agreed to, yeah. So Sonia, Gita, Peggy, I think they understood that from the start. And they were really the avant-garde, really, in those processes and became very skilled negotiators for Dawn, but for the women's movement globally. Being those transnational debates in the intergovernmental spaces of the UN at that point. It was an extremely rich experience. And this is when, as Gita said, we contributed to the shift of paradigm of the population debate huh, in the Cairo Conference, the International Conference of Population and Development, uh, dealing with the peculiar geopolitics of those times, but also with the presence of what I call the return of the religious in conservative form, because those forces were played that in particularly in, as in manifested in the presence of the Vatican and the UN. And so it was a fascinating experience. And I think we 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 had victories. We had victories in terms of the understanding, no? The epistemic of epistemic dimensions of the connection between population, social justice, rights, and gender, huh? and sexuality. 
I often think that without the United Nations International Women's Year and the Decade for Women, we wouldn't have a dawn. We wouldn't have something like this, uh, this network. So in that sense, I would say that dawn is a child of the UN because immediately it created a, an environment, a context um, for the kind of networking that, um, that dawn represents. Another, you know, the moment and also the learning experience for me is to attend these UN meetings and as observer, as NG observer, since Don has this exoc consultative status. That is something that I have never experienced and never witnessed. Um, I think in this, you know, a very complicated political, you know, the storm right now, you know, the perfect storm is a, a, how you you know, working with this institution and working in this complex of the power dynamic, pushing for the, you know, the gender equality and women's rights agenda, that needs a lot of skills, it needs a lot of commitment, and needs a lot of solidarity. Um, that's something you will never learn from the book, mm. and you'll only learn by doing it. And I think this dawn has uh, not only, you know, um, bring me and have, you know, teaching me, it's also dawn has mentoring many young feminists uh, from the, you know, different part of the global south, um, how to work in this space. So this is something I want to, you know, also highlight. Um, that's my learning, um, you know, in dawn. Los debates de Beijing, de, de Cairo, de Copenhague, con una Sonia Correa, hasta el día de hoy me acuerdo de ella tirada en el piso diciéndome Alejandra, esto es lo que se llama lenguaje consagrado, eh, no es obligatorio, pero esto es clave, esto es lo que tú puedes llevar como garantía de algo ya este, aprobado y, y analizado, acá tenés qué países son los que lo aprobaron. Acá están los grupos, este, como ella siempre me decía, bueno, acá están los grupos este, fundamentalistas, cuáles son los, los aliados, hacíamos todo ese mapeo de eh, aliados, no aliados, eh, desafíos, y eso es lo que yo tengo como en mi ADN feminista, ¿no? ese trabajo tan artesanal y tan necesario, pero tan generoso. Development alternatives with women for a new era. We're here today to celebrate 20 years they've been together. Woo! It all began in Bangalore, way back in year 1984. They talked of trade and financial might and its impact on women's rights. Woo! In 2003, when in some ways I formally became a Donny um, through the Don DTI uh, in Bangalore. I think the, the challenge that was before Don, and therefore the reason for the DTI, was the lack of um, multiple generational uh, leadership, 
was who was going to come after the senior dawn feminists. Um, we're no longer there or we're doing other things. What was the legacy of Dawn, not just in terms of its immense scholarship and activism, but who would take on the legacy um, and move it forward? Am I the last? Yes. yes. Okay. So, between the year 2008 and 2009, it was a very intensive, like fast training to feminism in my life. I was thrown into this strategy meeting with feminists from all around the world that I knew nothing about. It was the Gear Up campaign in CSW 2008. Magali was invited, Magali Pineda was my boss, and she couldn't go because the Bush administration has removed her visa to the US, uh, putting her in, in the terrorist list. I've never been to the US, had no visa, nothing. On my first day, I met, I mean, I met, but they didn't meet me, of course, because I was a scared mouse in a corner. Um, people that are in this photo that can, you can hardly see who they are in the main photo. This blonde hair over here is Alejandra Scampini, and she was, for me, like, cable a tierra. I don't know how to say, it was like, oh my God, this woman speaks Spanish, and she looks like someone I can connect with and, you know, like approachable and, okay. The others look like Star Tours. <coughs> Whatever they were saying sounds so brilliant, so new. And the one that struck me the most was over here sitting Peggy Antropos. But I was trying to play it cool and take a photo of you without nobody knowing, nobody <laughs> noticing. <laughs> so this is why this photo is so bad, because everybody was working, wearing their stuff, and me was like trying to take a photo of <laughs> So this moment, I met the uh, Women Global Movement. Um, so I, the, it, it, it wasn't an aha moment in that sense, but it was an aha moment in, in the sense of understanding the, that this organization is really willing to take chances on, in young people, that it's not the whole intergenerational idea and the VTI, it's, it's not a bluff. It's not a... It, 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 it became a really learning experience. My first year as a co-coordinator, I'm, I'm in my third now, um, I felt it was an intensive master all of the time. And the time that Gita took, that I know she doesn't have to teach me so many things and to share with me in a way that then I could make decisions, that I could, you know, put my voice and say, okay, I think this wouldn't work. And, and that we can engage in a, in an equal level. I think Dawn has been always very wise and careful not to get caught huh, into those waves of what is surfing now and to keep its directions, its original directions of dealing with the structural problems from a global South perspective, from a critical perspective uh, intact. Huh? And I think this is one element. And the other is, as you may have seen in this meeting, this in incredible effort to keep the horizontality within it, the limits. It's not just we are all equal, but to keep the, the functioning, the organization as, as fluid, as horizontal, and as democratic as possible. I think that's a, a, another big asset of organizations. Dawn is not working in just one broad area of work. They're working on issues of globalization, they're working on issues of the body, they're working on issues of political economy of conflict, they're working on political restructuring and social transformation, on climate, pieces of climate justice, they're working on digital justice. I mean, you look at the world and what are the large issues affecting people's lives. And most of this is either in collaboration with other partner organizations, and some of it is also, you know, in-house, as if I could call it that way, 
that Don members bring, their whole long experiences and analysis. And, uh, you know, they are really at the front lines of change, of doing very cutting edge uh, research. En la actualidad estamos, eh, estamos trabajando en, en varias eh, cuestiones. La primera es eh, acompañar el proceso de lo que, de lo que es el, la preparación del Foro de Economías Transformadoras. Es un foro temático en el marco de los últimos foros que se vienen haciendo, pero este foro tiene la particularidad de poder articular diferentes expresiones y alternativas a esta economía, a este sistema actual, pensando en los diálogos entre economía feminista, economía eh, popular, autogestión, agroecología, soberanía alimentaria y comunes. Este es un, un proceso preparatorio donde, eh, con las compañeras de DON, queremos impulsar la segunda edición de la Escuela de Economía Feminista, que fue una experiencia que compartimos el año pasado en el marco del Foro Feminista contra el G20. Esa escuela permitió eh, brindar y, y generar herramientas para las activistas que están justamente en diferentes espacios, no solamente en aquellos donde se discute economía o se analiza la economía, sino en espacios donde eh, se está dando una lucha sindical, eh, se está impulsando cooperativas o diferentes experiencias de la economía popular y también en activistas que venían pensando justamente las políticas de los tratados de libre comercio, las diferentes este, políticas que venía impulsando el gobierno en Argentina. Entonces eh, la idea era que la escuela se transforme en un espacio de educación desde las pedagogías feministas. Right now. Well, particularly for Dawn, um, I coordinated some research around the political economy of conflict. We did the research with, with six country case studies, and we published a book that came out this year, The Political Economy of Violence and Conflict Against Women. Yeah? And uh, that work was very interesting in that we were trying to look at violence in a different way, and uh, not or to broaden the analysis of violence, particularly violence in conflict, uh, where violence is very frequently seen as direct violence, particularly violence against women. And we were trying to look at other ways of analyzing uh, what was happening to women vis-a-vis -vis violence that they experienced in their everyday life, in their social life, in their political life uh, on, a, on a daily basis. And then we thought it was important to look at the political economic framings of violence and particularly then look at that in the context of conflict. And so we had a rich set of case studies that were done by women, by feminist activists, uh, living and working in conflict situations. Um, and the case studies were from Papua New Guinea, from the northeast of India, from Sri Lanka, Uh, in Africa, from Sudan, from Uganda, and then in Latin America, from Colombia. And this was a book we've just brought out. Uh, it's a framing we also felt we needed to extend, expand, get other people to use. And Dawn uh, Training Institute alumni, uh, a few of them uh, agreed to use the framing in their work and to begin to write using the framing to analyze the work they were doing. And so we have young feminists now using that, uh, using that framing to, to write on, on Palestine, on Liberia, again, conflict situations, uh, South Africa, Mozambique, um, what else? Yeah, I think those are the countries uh, from which we've got case studies. We were going to start with the issues related to capitalism, neoliberalism, corporate power, and we're starting on the right side of the table, and for the rest of the day, my dear Gita is going to take over with the facilitation. So assume that everybody has read the one-pagers. If you haven't read the one-pagers, That's the corner of the room where you can go and stand. <laughs> Facing the wall. Facing the wall. <laughs> so. 
And I think we, we might uh, discuss a little bit about the notion of crisis. I think it, this is not a crisis of the capitalism in terms of capitalism going wrong. I think capitalism is going very well for capital. So I think we should express this as a, as a central conflict, as the feminist economics say. It is the manifestation of the uh, central conflict be between capital and life, not just between capital and, and labor. And what people are saying in the street is, we cannot make a living. We, we can only make a living if we are totally in debt. Uh, this is the marketization of life. Pensions that we receive are miserable. So I think it's a very a concrete example of this conflict with, between capital and, and life. The uniqueness about Dawn is to really work on all this and look at the intersections in the, from the vantage point of women and from the vantage point of a poor woman, you know, based in the South, uh, who may be in India, a Dalit, poor, who may be, you know, a tribal, who may be whatever. You know, there are several identities that women uh, embody. I think it's important to know that for people to know that it's not just, you know, the bits of paper that Dawn produces, you know, the uh, on particular themes or partic for a particular conference, but it's how they come together to form a coherent argument or perspective that allows people to understand better what's happening in the world. So part of what I challenge myself around, and I challenge all of us as feminists, and I challenge Dawn as a, a radical feminist analytical space um, from the Global South, is what are new ways of telling our stories, new narrative frames that we can offer the world so that we can actually do this transformative work that we need to do in order not to not just survive as a planet, but to thrive as a planet and to thrive as humanity. Una vez eh, yo tuve que ir en el medio de un DTI, eh, tuve que irme por un fin de semana, eh, era en Uruguay, así que imaginarse el, el trayecto hasta Lillehammer en, Norwe en, en Noruega, este, que bueno, llegué a Oslo, tuve que irme en un tren como dos o tres horas hacia el norte, porque había un problema en el ICAE, que es este, la... Yo fui secretaria general del Consejo Mundial de, de Educación a lo largo de la vida y algunos hombrecillos estaban inventando algún, alguna cosa así, alguna cocina, decimos en Uruguay, y tuve que ir. Y el ambiente, bueno, claro, no eran todos, obvio, era, había, había un ambiente de conflicto. Fueron dos días intensos y volví. Ay, cuando llegué, esa es una imagen que no se me va a borrar. Llegué y parece que yo había vuelto al nido. Me sentí como un pichón, una pichona refugiada en el cariño de todas, incluso de las jóvenes que estaban. Me sentí tan bien, tan bien, que entonces son cosas que nos pasan en la vida que por más que después nos generen problemas, siempre vamos a estar agradecidas a, a, a la vida por haber tenido esos lugares.